the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, the origins of the Soviet T-50, air triathlon, comparing the top-tier fighter jets and metal beasts, a new Chinese MBT. Today, we're checking out a new premium vehicle in the Chinese tech tree, the T-69 2G MBT. We've already seen the researchable modification of this machine at BR 8.0 as one of the first rather original Chinese projects. The 2G version of the tank received a more powerful gun and additional protection which resulted in its rating being increased to 8.7. The main weapon of the T-69 2G is a dual-plane stabilized 105mm gun with elevation angles from between minus 4 to plus 18 degrees. There are also two machine guns, an anti-aircraft one and a forward-facing one. The front of the hull is covered by 100mm of armor placed at an angle and added with a layer of reactive armor, giving it an extra 370 millimeters of protection against explosive ammunition. The turret has a similar structure. Cast homogeneous armor with blocks of reactive armor from the front and slat armor from behind. The driver is located in the front of the vehicle next to the fuel tanks. The three other crew members are in the turret. The engine and the transmission are in the rear, and the ammunition is spread pretty much all over the combat compartment. Despite the fact that this is a fairly original Chinese concept, the designers were largely inspired by the Soviet models. Therefore, the tactics of use for this tank will be mostly similar to them. This is a somewhat slow machine which best shows itself while supporting its allies. Thanks to the new cannon based on the famous British L7, the arsenal of the Type 69 has rounds for every occasion. The APF-SDS rounds penetrating more than 340 mm of armor from 500 meters away is an excellent tool against enemy tanks. The Hesch projectiles are perfect against AA Tech and IFVs and there is an HEVT projectile to fight helicopters. Thanks to its good ballistics and a laser rangefinder, the cannon is comfortable to fire at any distance. The only possible drawback is poor depression angles caused by the tightness of the turret. Playing in hilly terrain, you have to roll the whole hull out of cover before you shoot, so it's best to choose the flatter parts of the map. The engine isn't very powerful, especially for a 37-ton machine, so the T-69 is pretty sluggish in moving around the battlefield. Many tanks will get to the position first, even if they give the Chinese a good head start. The armor is also hard to identify as a strength. It will only save you from anti-aircraft guns and high-explosive ammunition when hitting the reactive armor. The enemy APF-SDS rounds might occasionally ricochet, but don't count on such things happening regularly. The layout of the tank is quite cramped, and any penetration could be fatal. But, thanks to its good weapon and powerful ammunition, the T-69 feels great at medium and long distances. Plus. The tank has smoke launchers and an ESS system in case of danger, they will help you change position or quickly retreat into hiding. During the late 30s, the main and most widespread Soviet tank was the T-26. It was a good and numerously mass-produced light tank for its time. The main advantage was a 45mm cannon installed in a two-seater turret. Very few competitors could boast such weaponry. But already, by the beginning of the Winter War, 
they had to admit that the tank became hopelessly outdated. Its light armor was too vulnerable, and its chassis could barely cope with its weight. Shortly after, Soviet engineers got an order from the military and created a prototype of a new infantry support tank, the T-126. The armament was good enough to be left unchanged, but the protection increased significantly. It even exceeded the T-34's armor in the modification with a 55mm front. The mobility was enhanced by a new diesel engine, the V-3, which was a halved six-cylinder version of the legendary 12-cylinder V-2. They installed a torsion bar suspension, a technology that was new and promising at the time. And although the tests of the prototypes revealed many drawbacks, the T-126 looked very good on paper. It seemed that the tank just needed a little bit of improvement and it would certainly go into mass production. But in that same year of 1940, the Soviet Union acquired the German medium tank Panzer III Ausf G. Having studied the novelty, they had to think again. The crew's stations were very comfortable. There was even a place for the Commander Coppola in a three-seater turret. The 10-speed gearbox allowed the tank to accelerate up to 70 kph, while the pneumatic system significantly simplified its control. The Panzer III proved to be an exemplary tank in terms of convenience, and at the same time, it was a very fast one. Compared to it, the T-126 looked slow, blind, and uncomfortable. Then they came up with an idea to combine the best features of the Soviet and the German traditions in a new tank, the T-50. It inherited a T-126 type hull with sloped armor, but the three-seater turret with the Commander Coppola was made from scratch with the Panzer III's turret in mind. The German tank was also the source of inspiration for the two paired machine guns, as well as the colored commander driver signaling system and an indicator of the turret's direction, so that the driver would always be aware of where the gun was pointing. Mobility was also improved. Even with a simple four-speed gearbox, the T-50 could accelerate to 52 kph. As a result, the designers were able to create, perhaps, one of the best light tanks in the world at that time. What other light tank could boast three-seater turret, good armor, and high mobility? Not to mention that a 14-ton T-50 could compete against a medium Panzer III. Mass production seemed to be a question of when, not if. Unfortunately, the T-50 came too late. Its production was ordered to begin in July 1941. It was difficult to start the production as the new tank was much more complicated and expensive than the T-26. In times of peace, these issues would have been quite solvable. Some factories would need some time to re-equip, but that's it. But by the 1st of July, the explosions of the Second World War were already booming on the Soviet territory, and many factories started hurriedly evacuating. The production of diesel engines for the T-50 stalled, and without an engine, the production of the new tank itself had to be shut down. In total, they only produced about 75 vehicles against the whole 11,000 of the T-26. Instead of an advanced light tank, they had to start producing the simpler T-60 and T-70 tanks, which were outfitted with car engines. Huh. But that's a whole different story. You've repeatedly suggested in the comments that we hold a competition among the most dangerous predators in the sky. The top tier fighter jets. And that's what we wanted to do as well. But we had to wait until compatible machines of this class would appear in most nations. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the day. In today's triathlon we have the American Phantom E and the Japanese Phantom EJ, the MiG-21 MF from the German tree and the MiG-21 SMT 
from the Soviet one, the Mirage 3C from France, the British Lightning F6, the Italian version of the F-104S Starfighter, and of course, the J-35D Draken made in Sweden. In the first trial, we'll test their thrust-to-weight ratio. The contestants will need to accelerate near the ground and then go sharply upwards at an angle of 90 degrees. The winner is the one who can climb to the highest altitude. The planes are aligned near the ground at a speed of 1,200 kilometers per hour and wait for the command to start. Here we go. The participants soar up. The altimeters go crazy. They've already covered the first few kilometers. Five, six, seven kilometers. The jets are rapidly losing speed. The first to stall is the Phantom E, which reaches the 10 kilometer mark. The Swedish Draken and the British Lightning and the French Mirage climb a few hundred meters higher. Two more participants reach the 11 kilometer mark. They are the Japanese Phantom and the MiG 21 MF. The MiG 21 SMT climbs to 12,200 meters, but the winner in this test is the Italian Starfighter with the result of 13,600 meters. Moving on to the second test. The participants will need to destroy two airborne targets with missiles. One target will be flying away from them, and the other one will be flying towards them. The lightning locks onto the target's rear hemisphere from the largest distance away. Flying a little closer, the Mirage does the same. Next come both of the Phantoms and the Drachen, which is not surprising, as they're all armed with the same missiles. Following them are the MiGs, and finally the Starfighter. However, when attacking the enemy in the front, all participants predictably experienced some troubles. They can only lock onto the target at a gunshot range, and they simply don't have enough time to launch the missile afterwards. That meant that all the pilots have to pull a 180 degrees and only then launch the missile. The first to complete the maneuver is the Draken. The Mirage is closely behind. Following them, the MiGs and the Phantoms also manage to turn around. As for the Lightning and the Starfighter, well, they clearly lack in terms of maneuverability. Finally, the third test, Assault. We set four tanks on the map as targets. The contestants will try to destroy them in as little time as possible. Let's go! The Phantoms, with their numerous bombs and a ballistic computer, eliminate the ground targets almost instantly. Next to them, the MiG pilots report their success. Four large rockets are enough to deal with all the vehicles. The Draken, the Mirage, and the Starfighter take more time. Their secondary weapons are much less effective against ground vehicles. As for the Lightning, it doesn't have any bombs or unguided rockets at all. Well, the tests are over. It's time to sum up the results. But before announcing the winners, we'd like to award two vehicles with Audience Choice Awards. The first one goes to the Italian F-104S Starfighter. For its incredible speed and dynamics, as well as for its ability to carry six air-to-air -air missiles at once. The other one is awarded to the Swedish Draken for its astounding maneuverability. And now for the actual winners. The third one today is the French Mirage 3C for its excellent performance data and exceptionally successful air-to-air -air missiles, which make it a very dangerous opponent in the air element. The second place is shared by two participants at once, the Japanese Phantom and the MiG-21MF. Thanks to their excellent flight performance, wide arsenal of weapons, and ballistics computers, 
they feel great on the battlefield. Finally, the gold goes to the Soviet MiG-21 SMT for its stunning thrust-to-weight ratio and versatility, which makes it equally comfortable to fight both air and ground targets. And now, it's time to move on to answering some of the questions that you ask in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Anthony Santillo. Why do the Il 10s 23mm cannons have less penetration than the earlier Il 2s? Hi there. The muzzle velocity of the projectiles fired from the NS 23 cannon is lower than that of the Villa 23 rounds. Having implemented this solution, the engineers managed to reduce the recoil, but it had a negative effect on the penetration. In War Thunder, we have several versions of the Il-10 with guns of both types, so you can choose whatever pleases you the most. Lucas asks, what tanks do you recommend in the American tech tree? Hi Lucas, we've got lots of very interesting machines in the American tech tree. For example, we really like playing on the Shermans and the M18s. Now come to think of it, there's a video on our channel in Climbing the Ranks With series that's just about the American tanks. You'll definitely find something of interest for yourself in that one. Another question comes from Nikki Witz. How do self-sealing fuel tanks work? Hi there! The inner walls of self-sealing fuel tanks are made of special materials that start to swell in case of the tank's decompression and they continue to swell until the hole is sealed shut. Mark Maben writes, Can you tell me how to, oh, not that I use T-95 Doom Turtle very effectively? Oh, hi Mark. The T-95 is quite a unique vehicle. To maximize its potential and be as useful for your team as you can, pick the main direction of your team's attack actions. Moving along the map, Support your comrades by firing from behind the front line. Your powerful and precise gun is exactly what they need. And if the enemy manages to stop your assault, get in front of your teammates and cover them with your thick armor. And the last question for today was written by Wallison Daniel Scream. I just started playing War Thunder. How can I get to the jet tier faster? The most effective way to boost your rise to the top is having a premium account and premium vehicles. The main thing here is deciding what tree you want to research in the first place. We can't help but mention once again the videos of the Climbing the Ranks With series on our channel. They will help you make this choice. Also, we can recommend installing a talisman on your favorite aircraft it will bring you even more research points. And that's how we end tonight's episode. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, which premieres every Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Don't forget to subscribe, click the bell, and leave a like. Also, we haven't mentioned this in a couple of episodes, but still, Wash your hands and stay safe. The danger is still out there. And of course, please, tell us what you think in the comments below. We'll see you again in 24-7. Oh, not that again. We'll see you in just a week.